Good morning, everybody. Nice to be here. So, so gentlemen, uh, uh, I will just uh, introduce you to Nitin Sathya and his accomplishment. He has around, uh, you know, 6,000 hours of accident-free flying. You know, it's not easy to fly an aircraft and you, you don't have an incident or accident and here's a man who flew 6,000 hours in a helicopter, all types of helicopter which Indian Air Force has seen and flown in all kinds of terrains, including the, you know, deserts and including the plains and uh, Kashmir and the glaciers. And he has been part of multiple missions uh, in India and abroad. And uh, if I remember very correctly, he was in Congo also, and uh, he was, the, the country was on war. And there he was a commander who was leading an attack squadron there of the helicopter. And we will ask him about those missions. And he was part of an anti naxal mission also, you know, apart from you know, uh, we generally have certain situation in the country where uh, the helicopter pilots come into play to provide the relief to the people around, you know. So, I've got little questions which I don't remember so easily, so I've got something in my pocket, so I should take it out because it is not right on my part to ask him a question which is not appropriate. Sir, I would like to know from you, there is a fighter flying which goes in the Indian Air Force and people know about the fighter pilots who take part in the war. So how, how, if I, I, I may ask, because you have been uh, alumnus of uh, National Defense Academy and you have been uh, the alumnus of uh, Defense Staff College, uh, Defense Services Staff College in Wellington, as well as you are part of the TACD. TACD, gentlemen, is a uh, tactics and air combat uh, development establishment uh, and where uh, people, uh, the pilots learn the tricks and trades to, comp to fight a war. So he has been there as a student, he has been there as an instructor, so very experienced man. So I would just like to ask you, how it is different to fly a helicopter compared to a fighter? And how it is different? Okay, uh, very nice to be here firstly, and thank you for the introduction. Um, we know uh, when, we, when we came into the Air Force, all of us wanted to be fighter pilots. And uh, of course, all of us can't. And so therefore, uh, some of us went to helicopters, some to transports, and some to fighters. And uh, <clears throat> the thing is that the helicopter is a machine which actually should not fly. It's like a bumblebee. Bumblebee doesn't know that its aerodynamics cannot lift it into the air. But since it doesn't know, it flies. So helicopter is a machine with a million rotating parts trying to oppose each other and trying to bring it down. And the, the aim of the pilot is to keep it up in the air. So it is vastly different in, not in terms of aerodynamics, aerodynamics remains the same, but uh, vastly different in terms of control of the machine as such. And uh, the fighter flying that way is very simple. It is uh, because I've, I've flown both types, I've flown the fixed wing also. It's very simple to learn and teach, whereas helicopter flying is quite difficult to learn initially, but once you learn it, it is like you know, learning to do a, uh, ride a cycle for that matter. So any helicopter thereafter becomes a piece of cake. So it is different. It is not uh, all respects to the fighter boys, but uh, helicopter flying is definitely different and it gives you a different uh, kind of thrill. Sir, if I may, I ask you that what kind of task a helicopter can do, uh, which... Uh, I do, Achha, okay, fine. And uh, in your opinion, uh, yeah. what is most... Because we keep on hearing about the disaster relief operation which you people do. And uh, there are critical missions which you fly, like you were in operations in, in Congo. So, in your opinion, which is the most interesting part of the task which helicopter pilot does? Okay. Uh, the helicopter is a very ubiquitous... Uh, machine, it can do a variety of tasks. I don't know how many of you have sat in a helicopter out of this lot, one or two, just one or two. So very few people actually travel in helicopters and very few people know that a helicopter is as safe to fly as the fixed wing that takes you from A to B. But people are still afraid to fly in the helicopter for various reasons because it vibrates a lot and it's got too much of noise and uh, it flies too low. 
Right. But uh, the task that the helicopter does will range from, you know, the CHN Glacier, if you know, CHN Glaciers, every troop out there waits for the helicopter to come, not because of the food that it gets for him and the Russians and the, uh, the bullet, but it also waits for letters from home. So the helicopter becomes a messiah of, you know, good news to the boys and their morale is maintained by the helicopter. The other thing, of course, it does is rescue people in disasters. And I've been part of many a rescue. And the, like he asked me a question that, which is the best? I think uh, helicopter saving lives is one of the best things that a helicopter pilot can do is to save lives. Although I have flown the attack helicopter in which I have killed people. So I've seen both ends, but I still feel that uh, saving lives is a better way to, uh, you know, talk about the helicopter as such. Other than that, of course, there are carrying VIPs and a whole lot of things that it does uh, all over the country. I think, sir, well said, and I think saving life is something which is very, very important. Troubled northern sector, if I remember correctly. And you, you have been, a, uh, you know, uh, I say you have been lucky to command a unit who was involved in anti naxals operations. But also I... I know that uh, you volunteered and went as the head of the flying operation post the tsunami uh, in the Andamans in 2004. But I would like to ask you, uh, you were there also uh, commanding a unit, attack uh, unit in uh, Congo in 2006 and 7. And your experience of that uh, part and uh, if you can uh, let our audience know how uh, when a war torn country is there, how you are operating and what kind of challenges you face there and how you created a difference in the life of people of Congo. Right. So you want to know about the Congo operations. Yeah. Um, see, the helicopter always goes where there is trouble. So um, wherever there is a disaster or trouble, we are there. So Congo was one big disaster that was happening in uh, Central Africa. And uh, for all you financial experts, the Congolese franc used to be stronger than the US dollar at one time. And uh, it was one of the very, very rich countries of this world, which was, uh, you know, kind of looted by all the Western countries as well as uh, those in Africa. So there was a civil war situation there, and we were sent as the United Nations Peacekeeping Force in Congo, and we were operating on the eastern fringes of Congo, that is where all the diamonds, the minerals, the oil, Everything is there at, on the eastern side. And uh, the neighboring country is Rwanda, which does not have a single gold mine, but it is the largest exporter of gold in Africa. So you know where the gold comes from. So borders are porous. People come in and out, loot, go away. So all this is happening. So we were there to maintain peace. And uh, our helicopters were flying day in and day out. And when our attack helicopter used to fly, these militants or so-called militants, uh, they were actually Congolese army was split into two parts. One was fighting the other to gain control and gain, you know, the more area they could control, the more they could eat and feed themselves. So we had to keep these two fighting war warring factions uh, separate. And our job was to just fly and kind of... So um, I remember one mission in which we came under the crossfire. I mean, we were in the middle and these two guys were fighting. So bullets were flying over our heads and we did not know what to do. So we took, uh, and by the way, we are under sec, uh, the uh, UN uh, doesn't allow us to fire unless they clear it from New York. So um, only un, in self-defense is that I can fire the weapon over there. So what we did was we told them that we are under fire and we got clearances from New York. And we got airborne at night, wearing night vision goggles. We couldn't see a thing. And then uh, we found this. Um, the leadership was traveling in a jeep. Leadership, yeah, they were just one captain major or somebody and five, six people in a jeep. So we followed them and we shot that jeep. It's a beautiful story that I've written about it. And uh, uh, next morning, we saw that these, the same, the people we killed, we killed about 500 people that night, and 
The next morning, the bodies were arriving right next to our gate where there was a burial site. So it was sad that we were fighting somebody else's war in somebody else's country. And, uh, you know, we didn't know what if we were doing things right or wrong. But in any case, since we were under threat, so we had to use the uh, use of force was permitted by the United Nations. So this is one interesting story that comes to mind about flying in the Congo. So it's a beautiful country. Uh, not many people really vis can visit there, but if you get a chance, you must go there. It's really, really beautiful. That's very interesting to hear. Coming back from uh, Congo, where you were fighting for the other country, and how it is different when you were in India, you were, again, a commander of a team who was doing an anti-Naxal operation. So how do you think it is a little different from, you know, the enemy within the country and uh, they are the own people who are against the country? So how do you think how it was different and how it was challenging compared to your Congo mission and what anti-Naxal mission you had in the country? Right. So this is a difficult question, but you see, when you have to use force or use a weapon against your own people, especially an air weapon, if you fire something from the air on ground, it is not taken very uh, correctly and it's not eth ethically correct, morally correct to shoot your own people. And the Naxals are our own people. And so therefore, um, when we went in into the Naxal heartland of uh, Jagdalpur and you know that area, it's called uh, Dandakaranya, if you all know. So we went there and uh, we set up a camp uh, with four helicopters initially and our task that the government, I was in constant touch with the Ministry of uh, Home Affairs as well as the Defence Ministry, and our task was to cut out. They said only you will only provide support to the police forces. Now the police forces are allowed to shoot, uh, you know, with magistral orders. You can go and shoot whoever you want to. But uh, we were not allowed to shoot. Only if we were shot at, we were allowed to give. Uh, you know, firing towards him, but not to kill him types, just to make him run away. So, um, Naxal operations were different. The situation in JNK is more different than what it is in the Naxal heartland. And um, we had to exercise a, a lot of caution when we operated there. Although we did carry our own weapons, we were carrying our Garut commandos on board every time we flew. And so, um, our, again, our task again was to maintain peace and try and uh, help out the police forces in fighting these little um, you know, skirmishes that were taking place. Uh, one small, uh, I'll just add on here, that the day that 85 of the CRPF soldiers got killed, they got killed because um, at Chintalnad, a place called Chintalnad, um, I saw it with my own eyes, and I had to uh, travel on the bodies of these young boys uh, which we carried in our helicopter. We had, I was not flying that day, I was sitting at the back. So I, have to, I was sitting on the bodies of these young men who were killed. So it was a very sad state. It gives you uh, kind of anger. But why it's happening is a, it's a different story altogether. And what is the politics, what is the, you know, the financials that are involved. A simple, um, uh, that there's tendu leaf, you know the tendu leaf which makes beads. Yes. So the the, they give three rupees for one bag of tendu leaf, out of which one rupee comes to the local, one rupee goes to the politician, and one rupee goes to the government. So you can imagine how much exploitation again takes place in that area because of which we are in trouble. So you should understand the entire situation before you actually think that the Naxals are you know, something else and we are something else. They are our own guys who have not been treated well. Thank you, sir, and uh, this is an interesting thing which you told us about. And I believe you are a keen enthusiast of history, and uh, you have been writing and speaking in various uh, forums. Gentlemen, uh, we have seen the, uh, the pilot part of Air Commodore Nitin Sathe. Now I will uh, take you into the journey of uh, Grit and Weller, which we have already heard from him. Let us understand how he converted himself into an accomplished author. And uh, just prior to his retirement, he started writing books and a bit to record some unwritten uh, and spoken history of our armed forces. So his book on Tsunami, uh, 2004, uh, which happened, A Few Good Men and the Angry Sea was a book he wrote. And uh, 
It has been now taken up for studies on management and leadership. So I would like to know from him what motivated him to write this book and uh, what, it, what did he actually cover? Uh, the book for the audience, if you can just tell us, because you were there, you were the chief operation officer there and uh, then you wrote this book. So please uh, tell us uh, how the tsunami created the disaster there right. and how you people recovered. Right. I hope I'm not going to bore these technical minds uh, with stories like this, but, no, but they would love to hear. But uh, let me tell you one thing that each one of you sitting in the audience uh, can take away. Uh, there are a lot of good takeaways from the story that I'm going to uh, tell you now, because it, it, you're all handling men, machines, and uh, you know, what have you, money. So it was all there for me to learn on the job. So 26th of December 2004 was the tsunami, and uh, it wiped out the entire Air Force station at the Andaman Nicobar Islands. It's a very strategic base that we have there. And uh, out of the 750 people we had there, we lost 126 um, boys were killed uh, by the tsunami. And the entire island is just about 8 to 10 uh, kilometers wide. 8 to 10 kilometers, you know, it's just almost a circular kind of an island. And the total population on that island was about 40,000, on which in our, our, out of which about 4,500 died. Right. So there was devastation everywhere, and uh, we were flown in to start what is called the Triple R. I, I was told in the morning somebody mentioned Triple R to me, and I thought it was rescue, relief, and rehabilitation. That is what we were doing, and what was that? I was talking about rapid ransomware. Uh, uh. What do you say? Triple R? Triple R, what is the full form? Respond, yes. Okay. <laughs> so it was a response from our side. Uh, so we started the Triple R, the relief, uh, rescue, relief, and rehabilitation. So a lot of people were still under the debris, a lot of bodies lying around. There was no water to drink. Just a small example, in the first few days, we, were, we had to cut this, this bottle. A plastic bottle was cut sideways and we used to have a dal chawal in it, and the dal chawal was coming from the broken houses of people who were no longer with us. So that was the state there. Uh, the Indian mainland is a good four hours away by aeroplane. The runway was broken. The ships could not come in. The mobile systems were down. There was no communication. There was no water. There was no electricity. So if we stayed like that in such a situation, and we had to, I had promised the chief of air staff that I'll get the base back in a hundred days. So we worked very hard. Our team was excellent. But all of you will uh, agree with me that if you have to shed your boys to some other organization or some sub organizations to work uh, at a different place, you will shed the boy whom you don't want or who is least, uh, you know, uh, useful to you. So that, that is what actually had happened, that those 70 men that we got were people who were not required, had some you know, discipline issues, somebody had some problem, with his, problem uh, with his boss, so they're all with me. And let me tell you, not one of these guys misbehaved there, and we had a wonderful team going on, which worked day in, day out, right from cooking, to guarding the place, to re uh, reconstruction, everything was being done by us only because local labor, nothing was available. So uh, it was a massive task, and on the 100th day, we had the fighters operating from mainland India, and we, we to said, uh, told the world that the base was operational again. So it was a wonderful experience you know, of a lifetime where I learned that it, uh, you know, whatever happens, whatever happens, you, um, you should not give up, and we can always bring up uh, any worst of the situations, you can get it up to, uh, to the positive side. So that's what I learned best from my experience in the uh, Andaman Islands after the tsunami. So ladies and gentlemen, we are hearing the true stories of Grit and Weller from Air Commodore Nitin Sathe. And uh, let me tell you, this was just one book, very fantastic book he wrote, uh, which is he won a lot of international awards. It is about a pilot uh, who was, uh, we call it quadriplegic. I think when the body uh, down your waist is uh, totally paralyzed. The book named is uh, Born to Fly. So this book, uh, you got motivated with that gentleman. And uh, 
can you tell the audience uh, what you wrote in that book and what motivated you for that gentleman who was an ace pilot and then he came on the wheelchair? If you can just okay. tell so, me. Um, this is very, very close to my heart and I get very sentimental when I speak about this particular book that I wrote. This book is about my friend in the National Defense Academy, who was my batchmate, who was a MiG-21 pilot. He had a city accident and he was a quadriplegic, not a paraplegic. He quadriplegic. said quadriplegic is from neck down, no hands, no legs, nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? So he was in hospital and uh, he wanted to commit suicide at one stage and uh, we, uh, friends and family, got together and disallowed him from doing so. And uh, thereafter, he lived a life of 25 years in that bed and wheelchair, tied. He had to be tied to the wheelchair. A, it's a fantastic story, actually. I can't cover it in one or two minutes. But the fact is that I had to become him to write the story. So I went and slept in his bed at home. I interacted with his mother and his sisters. Then I went to his school and slept in the bed with the children over there next to me, Amazing. stayed a few nights, then went and played the game with them because he was in a sanic school, that boy. So his upbringing from a small village in Trivandrum to a sanic school, from there to the National Defense Academy, and then he became a fighter pilot, and a fighter pilot who was adjudged the best in flying from a small village. So he had made it very, very big from where he came from. and then his life came crashing down. So I seem to be writing only about disasters, but then uh, I tried to get them into a motivating kind of, uh, you know, I looked at it from the motivating angle, and then I wrote this book, his biography. And so I traced his life from his birth in uh, Chirankil in Kerala, uh, north of Trivandrum, and I brought him up to the accident. And thereafter, I tell you what it is to live as a quadriplegic, how difficult it is, and how he alone could keep audiences like you all and more captivated with his talks, with his writings. He started writing with his mouth. Can you imagine? He operated a computer with his mouth. Great. And then he wrote articles from, from international magazines to all the newspapers of India, the Indian Express, the, uh, all the defense magazines. He could write on sports. He could write on anything under the sun. So he started reading a lot. He started doing all this. I so think his he life was more meaningful. Applause, the gentleman on the book, uh, on whom the book was written. Yeah. So this was, so is being made into a movie now. Hopefully, I hope uh, it comes into a movie form, and more people can, you know, kind of get motivated. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, because I have got a lot of questions to ask, but uh, time, time is out. running out. But I would definitely ask you one thing: you have flown in the most difficult terrains. And I would like to know what is the experience when you were flying in the area of Siachen Glacier and how tough it was and how it has motivated you to write a book which will be launching shortly here today, the Siachen Soldier, which we will be launching. And before the launch, I would like to know ki how it was different to fly in Siachen Glacier and why you got so motivated you wrote this book called Siachen Soldier. Right, thanks. You know, um, I've been talking to the corporate in fact, um, some people from the finance sector also. And uh, I've been talking about management lessons from 18,000 feet. <laughs> OK, so how does a man who lives at 18,000 feet without a friend around him, without proper food to eat, uh, no company, no radio, no letters coming in, he has to live there all by himself with a weapon which is so cold that if he touches his hands, skin to the weapon, the skin burns. It is that cold, minus 55, minus True. 60 degrees. So that is the kind of environment that the Siachen offers uh, the Indian soldier. And uh, you all are sitting here and enjoying uh, this place and you know, uh, uh, feel free to do what you want to because those guys up there, day in and day out, there is firing going on. There is. In fact, it is the most horrific but the place to live in, but at the same time it gives you so much of strength for your later life that uh, you really bless, uh, you, you, wrote, you thank God, you feel blessed that you had an opportunity to work in the Siachen Glacier. So I had this opportunity to go there and work there. My, my unit was, I was commanding 
a small base in Jammu. Not small, it's quite big, 5,000 people. And uh, we used to operate up to the Siachen Glacier. So I decided to write about this man in green uniform, that is the army man who lives on the, on the post at 18,000 feet and uh, describe his life from his perspective. So in that I've written about what the helicopter means to him, what, uh, you know, he has, he has this Maggie noodles, he sleeps on a bed of chocolates because he doesn't have a proper bed. So he gets so many chocolates that he can't eat them, so he makes a bed of chocolates and put one, you know, fatta on top of it and makes his bed. And his clothes are reeking of kerosene all the time. He's inside an igloo kind of a place. There are rats there. There are cockroaches there who survive with him. And how they eat the chocolates and go away and his bed goes, keeps going lower. So you have to keep filling up new chocolates. So these kind of stories, whole lot of stories that I gathered from people there. I started writing this. And thereafter, of course, I added on more stories uh, of uh, the armed forces in general and about travels, about meeting people on um, on ships and boats and aircrafts and trains and uh, interacting with them on one on one and finding new things from them. So I wrote about all that and combined it to a book uh, which is the CHN Soldier. So actually it has got, CHN Soldier is the central story and there are stories woven around this. Um, I've also asked a friend of mine, Dr. Sunit Madan, who's in Chandigarh. She's a scientist, she's a software uh, person. And she's uh, given a small para, she's a poet. So she, on each story, I requested her to write a small poem so that it conveys the same thing in a little more artistic manner. Mm -hmm. So that's the book, uh, CHN Soldier, for you. That's uh, very interesting. Before we go for the launch. <laughs> so before we go for a book launch, uh, I think I, this discussion cannot be complete before I tell the audience that you have been... Uh, trained at the Defense Institute of Psychological Research as an interviewing specialist and has carried out a lot of personality assessment of thousands of candidates who are now working as officers in the Indian Air Force as the president of the Services Selection Board. And uh, you have been giving motivational talks to the corporate and you are training young boys and girls to join the armed forces, which we all know. But the most touching aspect is that uh, as part of uh, your philanthropic pursuits, uh, uh, you look after uh, paraplegic uh, soldiers and uh, that is part trusting, looking after orphan children as well and person with motor disabilities. Uh, and this is something brilliant thing which he is doing. I think he deserves a very big round of applause on this part. <laughs> and, I, and I would like to know, sir, how, uh, how, how you are so motivated as you mentioned about your course mate uh, on whom you wrote a book called Born to Fly and uh, how you are now looking after these people and where you do it? You do it in Pune from where you come or all of the places in the country? Not really all the places. There's a paraplegic home in Pune, which uh, all the contributions which come from, from my book go to the paraplegics. Great. And um, then I look after about 29 children, 29 orphan children in a uh, place called Ghar. So we, op we operate and we've got you know, uh, aid from the United Nations as well now. So uh, we've got a massive house for them. We take them up uh, to the best convent schools and uh, public schools in Pune, uh, often ch the only girls there. And uh, the concept is that we have paraplegic ladies who live there as their mothers. And we've got an old age home who become their nana nani. So it becomes a full ghar for the ladies, uh, for the little girls. <laughs> so you've got a child of four years to 16 years living there. And it's yes. a wonderful experience to be with the children there and yes. see how they are growing up now from what they started from uh, uh, to a couple of years ago. We just started now. So I hope it just carries on the way we are going. This is fantastic. and. Uh, I